Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com. Uh, it's been a long time since I made a video. Um, a lot of things have changed, of course, but um, I got some records and a few CDs and some other stuff I can show. I, I don't know how well this will come out. I'm trying it on my computer again. Last time it clipped on the audio. I apologize if it does that again, but hopefully it doesn't. Um, but anyway, um, I, I guess I'd like to start to try to make more videos, but I'm still working, so... Uh, despite the conditions of, you know, quarantine and the, the COVID-19 and everything. And anyway, um, so I'll just start going through them. So the first one I have, I bought a few months back. And it's by the band, local Minnesota band actually, called uh, Sussman Lawrence. Um, Peter Himmelman um, is best known from this band. Um, and some of the other members, Al Wolovich and Jeff Victor. They were active in like the late 70s, early 80s. This album... I don't think this this might have been their biggest album, but anyway, um, they also played with Alexander O'Neill. Some of the members played with Alexander O'Neill as a backing band at one point. Sound wise, you know, the thing is, I had known about Sussman Lawrence for many years, but I never spent time with their music too much. But I, I would almost compare them to like Elvis Costello. And some they're sort of a power pop band, but this record I only paid a few dollars for, if I recall. Yeah, well, no, I didn't pay quite that much. I know I got it for a deal at Barely Brothers, because um, he gave me a deal. But, but uh, yeah, I don't know. This is a used copy. I know I was looking for it. It's yeah, in reasonable shape. So, but it's a uh, first pressing, and it looks like it's a double. So, um, but given my limited experience even listening to their music, um, I can't really talk about like specific songs necessarily. I will say though, the thing about Al Wolovich, the I think he's the bass player. My friends told me a story about how he went to a cabin once, one summer in the 70s, and he learned to play, maybe even the 80s, uh, Yes's album Fragile on like two strings or something like that. So anyway, so interesting, uh, Sussman Lawrence, who I may do some more with, but this is their album Pop City. They have one or two others that I've listened to some tracks on YouTube, but I may have to talk about it at a later time. So then I know I found this record at Cheapo few months back on a discount and this is uh the most recent anathema record the optimist um which i know a lot of the anathema fans kind of didn't like as much as the previous three and i guess overall i would say that but um i still like a lot of it endless ways this came out in 2017 endless ways i think is my favorite it features the lee douglas the uh the female vocalist a lot of the this album does but i mean stylistically it's not dramatically different from their previous three records. Um, and the record is like a, I don't know, it's like a silverish with the little blots and stuff like that. The double, like 180 gram. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've wanted to get like some of the others. We're here because we're here and uh, weather systems, especially, um, and uh, uh, satellites. Um, but I just haven't gotten around to it. I, I bought this. I, I, I would probably not put this as high as those other three distant satellites, but I bought this largely because it was discounted. I think I, I paid about $10 for it for a double 180 gram. So, and of course, they spelled this record A&A. So. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, I mean, it has some other good songs on it, like uh, Springfield. Um, it's very more it's cinematic, I remember. A lot of like more samples and stuff. So that's one thing I think it distinguishes itself from the previous three records, but um, the modern anathema of the 2010s, so I think they're supposed to put out a record sometime soon, although everything with the uh, coronavirus, maybe it's put them back a little bit, but I know they were working on one recently, so we might see it this year or maybe next year. All right, so moving on, um, I did finally just bite the bullet and purchased a record I've been looking for and was out of print, and then I found out it got repressed. The, uh, in effect, the debut record from uh, Portland, Oregon's uh, band Menomina, uh, the I Am the Fun Blame Monster. And um, this is a really cool repressing. It came out, I think, in 2018 or 2019. I think it was 2019. With the, uh, the monster fold out, much like the CD, which is a lot of like sort of interactive um, artwork based, you know, uh, things with the packaging. So, uh, sort of a. Not marble, maybe marble, black, it's like a marble with a black and, and white splat, 180 gram. Um, I have the other, all the other Menomino records on vinyl. I think I even have Moms, but this was the last one, and this was 
my favorite Menomino album. And this also comes with um, some bonus track, like demos, I think, as a download. Download track. Of course, I'm struggling to put this thing in here, so I'll just hold off. But um, yeah, this is a one of my 50 or 60 favorite records. Uh, perfect record. Pretty much the flow. My favorite song would probably be The Monkey's Back, the last one. Very, like, sort of Hammond B3 featured uh, climax on that. Brent Knopf, who eventually left Menomina to do Ramona Falls full time, but he's uh, featured, he wrote that track and a couple of these others. Strongest Man in the World, Trigger Hiccups, Rose, they made an EP for that. Um, a lot of these songs ended up on a lot of college radio and, of course, Pitchfork. The Pitchfork audience does appreciate. So uh, if you've never heard Menomina, you like sort of quirky, experimental prog, this is a band to check out and this might be the best album to check out. Uh, their best song is probably a Wet and Rusting, which is, you know, almost a pop tune, but, you know, very clever. But um, this is still remains my favorite. It's one of my favorite records ever. Um, moving on, another record I've been wanting to find for many years, and it never got issued in the States on vinyl. Um, it's Porcupine Tree's album, Light Bulb Sun. Like Menomina's... Um, I am the Fun Blade Monster. This is my favorite Porcupine Tree record, and it sort of completes the collection for what I really have looked for because I have Deadwing and In Absentia um, on record on vinyl already. Um, I think I actually might have uh, the previous record, Stupid Dream, and um, I know I have Signify. I, I have most of their records that I, I consider essential. Fear of Bl Blank Planet, different story, but anyway. Uh, yeah, this is my favorite. Just overall, it was the record I got into them first back in the year 2000 or the 2001. I went to go see them at Nearfest, Northeast Art Rock Festival, and that was part of the reason why I wanted to get their newest record before I went to see them. And I knew they were popular. They had been kind of gaining in fan base among, especially the Dream Theater fan base. So, But yeah, this record is a favorite. It's for sentimental reasons and just, I think, from a flow st standpoint. She's moved on. Um, last chance to evacuate planet Earth before it's recycled. You know, Rush on Ice is a favorite. It's very the, the build up is great in that tune. The title track, How Is Your Life Today, has like a very Beatlesy kind of harmonies with the piano. So um, this this particular issue, I don't, I think it was a reissue, and I, again comes in a clear. None of these records are ever black that I end up buying. The standard black, so 180 gram. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know, with Porcupine Tree, I even have Neil Recurring. There aren't too many records I, I would seek out still. Maybe one or two. And if I ever get around to doing more of my collection as a whole, because I know when I did the Porcupine Tree feature video a few years ago, I didn't show all the records, and I had, had bought a lot of them. So anyway, Lightbulb Sun from the year 2000, my favorite Porcupine Tree record. I will finally picked it up on, on vinyl uh, online. So um, let's see here. We're looking at... Okay, um, so here's some new records, actually, a couple of records from the year 2020. Uh, Puri's Revolution, their comeback record, the first record in uh, like nine years. Uh, Euphnia, which um, unfortunately I got a little bit of damage in the packaging, but um, I love this band, you know, all the records, especially the Dark Third, of course, and it was great to see them come back. This record, I give a thumbs up if I'm doing a, you know, a album of the year right now or about middle of the year. Uh, although my old system would be past that. This would probably be my number one record, um, but, you know, this has been such a weird year. I, a lot of stuff coming out, a lot of stuff that might come out that, you know, no guarantee it comes out, but blue vinyl, kind of a, I don't know what color blue you'd call this, like a, a royal blue maybe. Um, but yeah, the, the two, two main songwriters in Furious Revolution, the band from England, um, John Courtney and, and Chloe Alper, Decided they, you know, their music they were making fit more of the Purism Revolution rather than the project they had done since Purism Revolution broke up. They broke up in like 2011. Just a little back on. They were active for like nine, eight or nine years. Um, but um, yeah, no, I, I really give this album a thumbs up. Um, it, stylistically, it doesn't vary that much from like the Dark Third, but. Uh, I guess, you know, Ain't Broke, Don't Fix It, and there's some new elements, and there's some samples, and so uh, some different patches they use on the synths I like about it, but um, every track works. It's only six songs, some epics, of course, in the prog tradition, so anyway, uh, Purism Revolution's Euphnia. 
So the next one that came out this year I picked up is uh, from a Canadian band that also hadn't been active in, for the most part, almost 10 years. They're called Bruce Peninsula from Bruce, the Bruce Peninsula area in, uh, in the Toronto or at least Ontario province uh, in Canada. Um, this is their first record since 2010, 2011, um, and I'm blanking, Open Flames. Um, the singer, Neil Haverty, the main front man, he ended up unfortunately getting um, like leukemia, but he it went into remission. But that was actually before the last record came out. But they put out a stellar track, though, in 2012 called Of Songs. It's, it was like 12 minutes, and I absolutely adored it. And then they hadn't done much. They did like a soundtrack a couple of years ago, but I, they never broke up. So it was great to see them finally put out something new. And this album's called No Earthly Sound. You can get on their Bandcamp page, Bruce Peninsula's Bandcamp page. Musically, I would describe them sort of as sort of um, tribal, experimental, prog of the sort, very like almost jammy, in a, but they don't have a lot of the long-winded pieces. And they also have a female singer, April, not April, what's her name? The last name's Bauer. You know, the, the, one of the members of the band, ours, has, a, has the last name Bauer, too, but uh, and she actually has a solo career, too. Um, Misha Bauer. She had a solo album that came out in 2019, Misha. But um, it, I like this album a lot, although, eh, I'm not saying um, I've become obsessed with it, but it's I, every song I've enjoyed listening to, enjoyed things about. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really great. I wish more people would hear about um, Bruce Peninsula. I heard about them about a little over 10 years ago on the Mars Volta fans forum, the Comatorium. There were all these fans talking about them. And uh, check them out, but I never really saw a large group of people get into them. But um, you know, for whatever reason, they've been able to still be an active band, and they're they're part of you know in that area. Bruce Peninsula is a uh, a geographic area, not a city in that part of uh, uh, Ontario. So no earthly sound from Bruce Peninsula. So I got two more. I did pick up the the Deer Hunters, or really it's under Casey Crescenzo's name. The Fox and the Hunt uh, soundtrack, which came with the Axe box set if you ordered that. Now, that was pretty pricey, and I owned all the records on vinyl before that, besides what, besides this piece. But this is an instrumental um, release uh, with this orchestra. I don't know if Casey or any of the members actually even play anything on this. Maybe they helped arrange it, but um, it came with the box set. But uh, I just didn't really shell the money for the box set, but then they released it uh, individually as... as Pink, or not pink, would it be like an orange, it's like an orange crush uh, colored record. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of pieces from, if I'm not mistaken, Act 4 and Act 5 that were sort of reinterpreted. And like the titles aren't even on here. I've gone through and listened to it a couple times. You'll just hear references to the different acts, songs of the acts. But yeah, The Fox and the Hunt the, by, from, with the Awesome Orchestra by Casey Crescenzo and then the conductor's name is David Mostler, probably some kind of European uh, ethnicity with that name. Um, but yeah, it was cool to finally pick this up, and I love the Deer Hunter, of course. And being sort of a completist, I, I when I was able to buy this individually, I had to do that. So, but yeah, that came out a couple of months ago. Uh, I think it was in March. So, and then the last uh, vinyl I'm going to show today is just a record. A friend of mine on on YouTube, uh, Vinyl Fury, Dan. Uh, he showed his copy. This is Silverchair's last record, maybe the final Sil Silverchair album from 2007, Young Modern, a record that I, I really do like a lot of. Um, and it came out in, in the, it was issued maybe a year ago, but it was only like down under, of course, where Silverchair's from, like being issued. But I found someone selling it in Chicago on eBay. So it's again, like Royal Blue. But this is, uh, I love the last three like proper rock records that Daniel Johns did. This would be one of them I would consider, mainly in the 2000s. This would be the, the Young Modern Record. The Disassociative album was a collaboration with Paul Mack, which wasn't Silverchair, but it was very, uh, had elements of Silverchair, of course, because Daniel uh, John sings lead on that. And then uh, Diorama, which a lot of people consider their favorite. Um, but yeah, they were doing more of the sort of symphonic orchestral, you know, you don't call it grunge exactly, I would call it, you'd call it prog of a sort. Uh, a lot of Beach Boys elements on that, and it continued on 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 this album too, um, and you know I've kind of grown to feel that this is the best of those three. Although I kind of see them all equally, but um, especially those thieving birds, strange behavior, and those that that sweet at the end of side one. Oh, it's so 
I just can't get I, at least it's stuck in my head after I listen to it every time. Um, but the whole record, really, the, the, the two single straight lines and reflections of a sound, Young Modern Station, they actually played at First Avenue, and I actually, it was the same week or weekend I had to actually go to a, my cousin's um, bar mitzvah out in, in the Bay Area, and so I missed them, and I'll probably never get to see Silver Chair, but what can you do? So I remember what actually they played on, it was like The Tonight Show, and Daniel John's voice, unfortunately, kind of went. It was hard to watch, but... Anyway, I'll just show two more items uh, today. I, I also picked up a couple of compact discs. Probably not the only ones, but the, the only, only ones I have right to show right now. Uh, the Dirt Poor Robins, um, the Raven Locks, sort of uh, basically the three Raven Locks um, records, are all in a double disc. It came out a couple of months ago. And if you've never heard Dirt Poor Robins and you like the Deer Hunter, as I mentioned, definitely recommend it. Um, great to have the whole thing in one release like this. It's a double CD with a lot of write-ups and the lyrics and stuff like that, and talking about the story. And then uh, Dean McGraw's uh, album, uh, Seventh One, from 1997, um, was, re was reissued or something like that. It was originally in Germany. It's, um, his second solo album. Um, it's got a lot of the, the musicians that play with Dean McGraw that are known for, like Peter, uh, Peter Strushko and um, like Jim Anton, some other people. But um, I think Jim Anton's on this. Anyway, because um, they did a stream of, like a couple months, like a month, month and a half ago um, with Ellen Stanley from Red House Records and Dean was on doing Q&A and stuff. I was like, I don't have that record. I don't, they were streaming some of the songs and I can't remember which one it was. It was either Kitchen Man or Shadow Dancer. And they, I don't know. But I love Dean McGraw. He's a treasure to Minnesota. Amazing, inventive acoustic guitarist. Not just acoustic guitarist, but um, to have one of his other CDs that I never got before was a, a thrill. So... But anyway, I'll uh, wrap this up for now, um, but thank you for watching. Uh, myself, my wife, we might look to do some more videos if these come out and it's warranted and people are doing vinyl collection videos and all that stuff. I'd like to do it. Our vinyl collection's in a room upstairs that we still haven't put in order, but uh, otherwise, thank you for watching. We'll talk to you next time.